clearly we're investing in women's health integrated research, whatever that means. Here to tell us what that means should somewhere be Dr. Maxwell. When we think of research, we always expect to see a room full of microscopes right. and test tubes, right? Well, and you're going to get there. We're, <laughs> okay. th this suite is really where we uh, manage most of the, the overall consortium. We have one at NIH, one at the Uniform Services University, and then the larger one here uh, in partnership with the Nova Health System. In addition to the three labs we have regionally, we have laboratories that we're overseeing at Duke, at Harvard, Ohio State University, Evanston North Shore, University of Chicago, University of Pittsburgh. Um, you know, so it's, it's a fairly large consortium that we oversee uh, with command and control here. What's so unique what about that? is unique about ANOVA is that um, there's really nothing like this we have in women's health. Uh, in the United States in terms of the resources that we have here to bear. So this is our uh, genomic sequencing facility. Um, Are we, there genes in here right now? Sure. I mean, we've got, uh, yeah. <laughs> We've got samples that are being uh, sequenced now. What sequencers do is they uh, uh, basically decipher the genetic code of a particular sample one's interested in looking at. So if we want to look at what genes are altered in the context of cancer, we do that here. Watson and Crick uh, published the results of the DNA helix in 1953. So over the span of 50 years, uh, we had the Human Genome Project that evolved. That project took over 10 years three and a half billion dollars. It involved seven countries with hundreds of scientists. We can accomplish that in one to two weeks here with one instrument for about $10,000 and it's getting close to where it's driving down very quickly and exponentially to where probably within the next uh, two or three years we'll have genomes that are $1,000 a piece. And we can literally uh, sequence, you know, hundreds are you know more genes in the context of about 90 minutes with this kind of an instrument so it is it there's a, a newer model that's called the personalized there's always genome a model. Model. yeah yeah <laughs> well it's the personalized genome machine we still got a lot of fun things you haven't seen yet oh okay good tom is uh is a nationally acclaimed uh protein chemist so you're in the cell and tissue culture facility um, in this facility, what we can do is we can grow human cancer cells and we can do experiments on them. And so one of the challenges that Dr. Maxwell has at the bedside is in effectively treating patients with chemotherapies, and especially these broad uh, cytotoxic chemotherapies that just kill all cells and kill all cells that are rapidly proliferating. And so that's a rather uh, arcane way to treat cancer we know now because everybody's cancer is different just like everybody is different. And so in, in many events, um, certainly in ovarian cancer, 80% of these women come back with recurrent disease. And that's because the cancer cells have figured out how to evade that cytotoxic therapy. And so that no longer is effective. So and so what we need adapt. to... It's absolutely right. They're adapting. We know that ovarian cancer is exquisitely unstable genetically. Um, and that comes out of studies like we do here in, with genomics. And that unstable genetic profile allows those cells to sense what's happening, to modify their phenotype, and then basically kill that drug and kill the eff efficacy of that drug. And so what we're doing here is we're trying to understand what the cell does to mount a resistance mechanism to that, and then how we can come in with second line and kill that resistance mechanism to make that drug then effective. It actually sounds like um like a pretty tactical... Uh, cancer is tactical. Yeah. Cancer is tactical. It's probably the most deadly tactical enemy that we have, isn't it? Well, and I would say, you know, I've heard people draw the analogy. You got cancer providers, and I don't know many cancer clini clinical providers and scientists who are not, you know, out there really pushing the limit in terms of what they commit to it. So, I mean, they are warriors in and of themselves uh, against a disease which cancer is the enemy. This is our proteomics laboratory. In here we have loud instruments that have lots of vacuum pumps in them. That's what's loud. We'll so, just talk over them. Yeah, so these instruments allow us to uniquely detect the registry of proteins, which is their mass. So genes have a four signature to them, ATGC, and that tells us the, the code of genes. In here what we can do is we can decode proteins by how much they weigh. 
what's the relationship uh, of, a, of a gene and a protein? Because I hear genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, whatever. Um, right. so just real the, quick. So the dogma of biology is that genes make RNA, which make proteins. Proteins are the worker bees of the cell. Genes don't do anything. They just simply code the dictionary for the words that make up the sentences of life, which are proteins. So proteins are those entities that make cancer, cancer. Every, everything is nanotechnology, and so what we do is we can inject a cancer patient specimen onto this nanoflow chromatography system, and we can spread out the proteome. Proteome is very complicated. We know there's 22,000 genes. There's probably millions of isoforms of proteins in the cell. So it, and what was it there were billions of? I got six billion base pairs. Base, ba base pairs. Six billion base pairs. Right. And so there's six million A, T, G, and Cs in the genome. Okay. Right. One percent of that makes up for for genes that code proteins. But when the gene codes a protein, it can co code multiple isoforms that can get modified in 300 or more different ways. And all of those different modifications endow a different behavior to that protein, a different activity. And so, to understand that... This is a lot more complicated than chess. It's far more complicated. It probably approaches the, the level of complication of astro astrophysics. But it's if we could... more complicated than we thought and will ever be able to think of. But what, what, um, what and, and maybe we could step out here yeah. just real quick because I want to ask both of you this. And we can come back if you wanted to show me one specific thing. But I wanted to ask this question in, in a quieter place because this is on my mind, is that when we talk about everything that we learn from this research. Um, we're like, we're essentially, the, the, there's just billions of permutations. And the more we know, the more complete and the more focused we are. But what accomplishments for the patient are we seeing along the way? Because actually having the complete picture is not gonna happen tomorrow. Well, you know, breast cancer is probably, at least in context of cancers, the folks that are out there kind of leading the pack. Uh, you've got very targeted therapies that are being given, in fact, clinical trial designs uh, and algorithms are based on whether somebody is estrogen and progestin uh, receptor positive or HER2 receptor positive, and you get channeled into different trials if you have that kind of a phenotype versus if you're what they call triple negative, you're getting channeled into other trials. Uh, so. That's something that's, that's happening today. I think that in the future, it's gonna be a lot more complicated. Rather than looking at three things, you may be looking at a panel of 100. And depending on uh, you know, the various patterns that you have of expression, it may dictate any number of different trials that you get put into. So, or different therapies that you just have as bread and butter. And that, that time is coming. Why do you choose to work here versus working for a pharmaceutical company? I think there's probably at least three different answers to that. One is the intellectual freedom. Um, I'm not driven by the 18-month deliverable of a pharmaceutical company. Um, quite honestly, the other one is to be able to develop a research culture and environment in partnership with Dr. Maxwell, who is battling this stuff in the clinic. That brings a special uh, motivation to what we're doing in the bench, uh, at the bench side. And, you know, I think working in a very novel environment that is one that is partnered with um, community hospital and, uh, you know, these physicians that are private practitioners but, but are also intellectually involved in research and stimulating that type of culture is sort of the next way I think that healthcare is going to be delivered and healthcare research is going to be done. So I think it's th those three answers make for a very interesting mixing pot for where I work and why I work here. These are laser capture microscopes we talked about. Laser. See, you say things like it, like it's routine, you know? And right. I'm like, whoa, 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 slow down. Laser. In the operating room, we resect the tumor. But when we take it out, that tumor's got a mix of tumor cells, normal cells, inflammatory cells that the body is sending to battle against the tumor. But when we have such sensitive platforms we're doing the analysis of the genes and the proteins with, we can't afford to have that background contaminating feature. Mm -hmm. So we have to use a laser to do a second surgery. We go in and we individually dissect out the individual cells that we then take to put into the pipeline of analysis. Because if we had some normal cells mixed in with the abnormal cells and we're trying to develop a signature for the abnormal cells, we may overcall something or miss something. 
Who was the first person to do this? Well, uh, actually, some of our contemporaries here in Northern Virginia uh, developed uh, the technology for laser capture microscopy. Uh, when because they, were they said the it was not good enough to just take that tumor right. out. We need to get inside that tumor. Right. right. And, and this, this is um, this is a tumor from a uh, from a patient. That's so that's. Uh, to see on, it, on there, right? Oh, I got it. So that's a that's a person. That's a that's a person who had a tumor. But that person's contribution in providing her tumor and her information for research is really what's going to guide what we have in the future for how we better take care of patients. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll show you our, our tissue bank as well, okay. but this is where we process the tissues before they ultimately feed in to the analytical pipeline. You see, if we wanted to take this, uh, this little gland of cells out, mm -hmm. we would fire uh, the laser in, and use the little joystick. You basically will draw circles around everything that you want to take out you activate the laser and then it'll go through the specimen and it'll cut and catapult each of those little areas that you want out, leaving everything you don't want behind. Not to be crass, but um, have you ever heard any swearing coming from this room? Because oh, yeah. they fired the laser oh, yeah. in the wrong direction, like no, missed it or this didn't is, circle it quite well enough. Or, uh... This is really fun for about an hour, okay? Yeah. It's not fun a after about six hours. I, and if you're somebody in here, like one of our trainees who's been doing it for about a week or two, it's, uh, it's hard coming to work, I think. Yeah, it's mind so. numbing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Some people but it's important. Right? in the day it's this mind numbing but important. It, it, That's like the research bubble. You know? <laughs> mind well, numbing but important. It's automated these days. So when we, we can draw the, the, the little things around it and then sit back and let the laser do the job. So somebody in California can draw the circle? You could, okay. yes. Now you're yeah. talking. Yeah. I'm so lost. Are you recording everything? We're gonna run out yeah. of tape. I got nineteen, but I have another card. <laughs> oh good. We have uh, networked in with a uh, very large computer cluster. It's actually connected to the Carnegie Mellon supercomputer in Pittsburgh. You're connected to the Carnegie Mellon supercomputer in Pittsburgh? Yes. So we had to... So uh, I probably shouldn't touch any of these buttons then, right? Nah. You know, I'm military, so we quite honestly will end up probably just building out this cluster to where we'll be relying on, on no one. I don't feel comfortable in here anymore. Okay. <laughs> You know, most centers, they collect tumors, they get some molecular profiles, they think it's great, they have to go to some other group to validate it, or maybe they look at some genes and now they want to look at proteins, they go to some other group. Here, everything. This is what, you know, this is truly systems biology, where you're looking, just like Dr. Conrad had mentioned, at all the molecules in the cell, the RNA, the DNA, the protein, the metabolites, to be able to make sense of this. And we call this integromics, where you're taking the genomics, Ooh, new one. the proteomics, mm -hmm. integromics, or you could even say it's interclomics. And that's when you're taking the different uh, omics signatures, combining it with clinical information. So it, it's really how we integrate lots of information uh, together that's going to guide the way in which we treat people in the future. And this is uh, partially funded by a Nova Health System. Right. Yes, yes. It's mainly uh, the lights and the real estate and then some of the projects that I'm pushing out um, in obstetrics and other areas of women's health that ANOVA is, is helping with in terms of assisting that forward movement. You said we pay for the lights? The, the utilities and the, and the lease. So you could say that we turn the lights on for you so yes. you can turn the lights off on cancer. Okay, sure. <laughs> I'm going back to the light switch and I like it. You want me to say it? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I think it's great. It's perfect. You know what they came up with? This is great. So he, say, he says, so Anova pays you to turn the lights on so you can turn the lights off on cancer. There you go. <laughs> I love your light switch analogy. <laughs> this interview is actually difficult for me because you are using the latest science and pulling teams of innovators together in order to do uh, good for all of mankind and womankind. And I changed majors from engineering to digital video because the math was too hard. <laughs> <laughs> You're everything my father would want me to be. Well, you know, uh, I just tell my son every day, uh, it doesn't matter what you do. You just gotta be passionate about what you do and you gotta make a difference at the end of the day.